Um, it's so sad to see the, the YouTube link with just one viewer, which is me. <laughs> it's sort of like a microcosm of poetry, of the poetry world, right? You want the world to see you, but there's like one of you and that's you. <laughs> Two, three, four, am I here? Just the music stopped, but I should not. Can you hear me? You're, you're out of sync with your lips. Tell me something new. <laughs> um, uh, um, I no, said, is this okay? One, two, three? Yes. Uh, Gretchen, I think, is going to join us. It's 11 o'clock in the morning in New Zealand on the 8th. So yes. Oh, hi, Gretchen. I see her there. Is she there already? Oh, good. I'm, in, uh, I'm at home. Under lockdown. <laughs> oh, I can see you. Hi, Gretchen, love. <laughs> Hi. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Oh, you look beautiful. As a, per as a person whose birthday was yesterday, your time should. It was. It was. 77. <laughs> oh, wearing it very well, dear. Was it your birthday? Yes, it was. It was my birthday. Oh, fantastic. Yeah. Happy birthday. Yeah. Under lockdown, and it was the best birthday I've had for years. Well, we're still in our little bubbles here. They call it bubbles in New Zealand. So our bubble consists of three people, and uh, everyone dropped off champagne, gin, flowers, books, uh, a delicious dinner. It was just fabulous. <laughs> anyway, enough of me. Let's listen to you. <laughs> Thank you, Gretchen. Actually, her birthday, Edwin, was the seventh. So, as I said, that was so. This is our seventh. I did email her on her seventh, and now it is right. I like that we each have sevens, or yeah. that we each have our own numbers. Oh, everybody, it's seven o'clock here. Let's applaud. Yes, we have to go out. <laughs> Yay, that felt good. Okay. Um, people are uh, filtering in a little bit. I'll tell everybody what happened is that um, YouTube at 640 took the link down saying it was inappropriate. And I checked. There was no content at all to be deemed inappropriate. But the word body, body lingo, apparently oh, is a problem sorry, yes po poetry is transgressive <laughs> yes you can talk to each other in the chat because it, it, it makes my day also sorry how, how many times do we want are we called inappropriate so merely because we're poets I and i forgot i lost my train of my thought so <laughs> i think i was getting at poetry and walt frazier snuck in there so um there you go Thank you all for coming by. This is so it's so beautiful seeing the, the screen slowly populate our lives. I can, I can hear. I'm hearing. Okay, as long as you can hear. And I can see, and I can see. Fantastic. <laughs> okay. Could you all mute yourself because I'm learning how to mute people and I can't quite do that yet. Um, I'll say in the corner up here we have um, I have all the bios. First of all, welcome. And thank you for coming. Um, tonight we have, uh, this is week two, day two. Oh, that sounds, that, that, I don't want to do that because it, it feels too, like, I don't want to give, um, structure to days. We're doing that enough, aren't we? This is today. And today we're going to hear from, um, people that have uh, participated in this anthology that I edited. And Contopath Press published it, and um, I'm very proud of it. We're going to have Marcella Duran, Mona Chopra, Christopher Funkhauser, and Alina Alexander. They're going to share their work with us. And while that's happening, in one screen, we have KJ Holmes, who's going to be improvising continuously throughout the hour. What you, can, what you all can do, you have the option. I'm mandating power to you all. You can go to where your name is on the right 
top. Click on that, it says in the bottom there's something called pin video. It makes that screen large. You can choose to either have the speaker large or pin KJ or literally anybody else could be large on the screen as you're hearing it. It's up to you. It's a way to kind of like break through this wall somewhat. Uh, we're gonna um, read and share for about an hour and then we're gonna have a post talk hangout. Whatever you want to talk about, we'll be here to talk. Urayuan says, please help me, I can see. Pedro Pietri, yes. Pedro said, please help me, I can see. And how that applies to the world that we're in right now, doesn't it? Well, I need help because I can see. So, um, on that note, I'm going to read a short, I'm going to start the proceeding with a poem. And from there, we'll, we will begin. Thank you all for coming. I think I've said all the logistical stuff. Okay, everybody, thank you. <clears throat> this is called Invocation of the Built World. Are you asleep, my love? The animals perceive our separation as migration. Are you there, my love? I can't see you on screen. The voice is not a skin wanderer. Were that all I could say away from sleep? The dynamics of landing, once left, appear in the sound of how words become who we need, and then ask again, what were we most at our lowest? I'll tell you about dynamics. I have a few shards left in the size we inherit. You and I, as archetypes of Galapagos, survivors of mourning, how miraculous to attend destiny at the same hour. Oh, catacol I finite, oh, maker of stars, we've left this place, we've seen what comes back. So muchness is usness. And if I were to tell you how my legs, my limbs, how they keep running when I lay down, could I share that darkest clutch, melting, better patsy with pillow speak? All these words remind me of how little I've grown, unfolding in my form, unable to exact a sequence for a dream. Oh, separator of unseen temple, how stable my quiver once down. If but sight were to find a home, would not the sightless have highest command? Swallowed in stargaze, would not the buried know best the pit? The unseen world, the next no longer, the perceived no longer, right here, to nurture the joy, least written past joy. What shape builds the world? that passes before us, before our us, my love, our eyes. What would it be to remember the happiest time in your body? When you think of that time, what would it feel like? Oh, built world, the almost here and what air has become. Us searchers, because we don't know anything but the sound of the mallet hitting the saw as the musical note, not the vibration, but what caused it. Ours is the hit of the impossible search, the untellable pain, the burden of being that one bit of truth we can't escape from. A heart steeped in fantasy, unavoidable to conjure conviction out of fantasy, and our needs, because that's what we know how to do. O oh, hydraulics of inversion, announcing yourself as occasion. O oh, divine as carnal, unman alone as human at window. Seems a subversion to do sensation as life, to call back a willful sort of delicacy as a sanitizing moment. How you kill the good germs with the bad, to know what you're destroying and what you're saving. And that 
Holding on to bad can be good also. I am coming to you. I don't know yet what it is I have, only that it's for you. The I don't know is also for you. The enormity of my here and gone, all for you. Even my arriving is something I've been saving for you. I didn't know that before I was knowing to say that. Even all of my, what I've had and been and seen before seeing, all that for you. Somewhere off screen, you can click for the final outcome. Somewhere you can't see. There, past the edge, a temple disguised as a human. Oh, love, I want to show care for these things you have said and shared. I am so tired, and my sleep, I am not able right now, beyond this. I wanted to start with uh, Marcella. Marcella Durant, um, her most recent book includes The Prospect, which is forthcoming from Delete Press as soon as shipping is safe again. Marcella will read for a little bit and she'll come back later on. Thank you, Edwin. That was such a beautiful poem. I'm actually kind of choked up. It was so moving. A really, really amazing poem. And then seeing Kay Holmes dance at the same time. I don't know. I like these Zoom readings. They're kind of great, right? I don't know. This It's um, bringing intimacy back to poetry or something. <clears throat> anyway, um, I'm a, yeah, I'm a little choked up over that poem. It's so beautiful. So I'll, I'll start with what's in the anthology, which was based on an Alexandrine form, and then later on I'll, I'll read some new work. But this is called Rays of the Shadow, which is after a, a term from Victor Hugo um, about the rays of the shadow. A weather forecast of colors like yellow, red, and direct green. A green ray glows just before the earth shifts to dark, and such a color means go, speed, fast, machine, and nature. Leaves, grass, trees, everything that translates sun to breath, breath to body, body to wood, and wood to page, page to mouth, then tongue, and once translated, breathes again to light returning after a night of colors folded together. Pages that touch tongue folded and wave or dissolve in wind and water, in small rocks that line beaches or premonitions of some inarticulate event. The sun is rising, perhaps, in new geometry to line a different spectrum of color, as color defines substance and leads back to the sandy fossils that hold spring and season, evidence that the sun returns, that the glow holds. Evening. Figures stand against sea in strange color, ask why water is blue and we answer green, or reflects all that is around it sometimes. City does too, water around center of color blue. If I could answer figure or lone person on beach or street, the one whom this is about, hero. Tale is told. Offer to the public its tale. On the town green gathered music and balloons saying food, a recompensation, what it said to you. You had it taken away, felt deprived because your neighbors took it of different colors than you. Ascribe it to that, accept the free gift and the tale, although really you came by it by most despicable means, say word, stolen, guilt, bugs fly around light. They are more innocent than any of us, surrounded by a sea of sameness, ours. Song and other alien artifacts within a city of billions, like that you are alone during doing myriad things in combination with so many others so different from you, 
but how to negotiate with them this shared space. Who notices rock raising buildings above our heads? Today, I mourn you before you are even gone. If you look at everything long enough, it will become water or it becomes gold air soil still, weather tree, red grass horizon, silver neon wave, wave upon next to under with wave, wave a wave along wave into water into angle gray blue pink, magnificent building red, hot green, azure jets, white dark sided gleam violet flash gold, Oh, gold, silver, red, dark, arc, ciel, stun, crest, star, night. Sky is always the brightest part of a vision. If you look at water long enough, it becomes. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Marcella. We'll, we'll come back to you. Sounds good. Our next reader is Mona Chopra. Mona is an acupuncturist, hypnotherapist, meditation instructor, and mind-body healing arts practitioner in New York City. Her full bio is in the chat. Mona? Thank you. Let me know if you can... Just come closer to the microphone. Oh, all right. Okay. Getting so intimate with my computer here. Is that better? Yes, thank you. Okay. So... I'm going to just lead us all in a, in a little journey um, through the acupuncture meridians. And I'll just say briefly that usually with acupuncture, we decide on the treatment. It's, very, it's individualized. That's kind of one of the wonderful things about it. It's not a one size fits all thing. It's like, what's that right? as you might choose what's the right line for that person that's going to change their life, that's going to press the right button. So, But I was thinking about what would be appropriate for doing it in a group, knowing we're having some shared experience here over these past several weeks. And so um, based on that, I've chosen um, some points and channels and a particular principle to work with. So, um, so just get really comfortable where you're seated or laying or standing. And I'm just going to ring a bell as a way of allowing an entry to go inside yourself. If it helps to close your eyes, so you don't have to look at the screen, but although you may want to be watching the um, movement there, so it's up to you. And yeah, here we go. Allow your attention to go inside yourself and just bring all your attention to your left foot. We're going to begin this journey inside the meridian system with a point that is located between your pinky toe and fourth toe on the foot if you just come up a bit. Right in that area there, there's a point that opens up a channel that we know to be a repository for postnatal junk. In other words, this is a channel that holds all our shit. And it is an opportunity now to say whatever has accumulated over these past several weeks, or of course, months and years and decades of life, it's an opportunity to open up this release valve and let our body discharge, release, let go of some of what's been being held and accumulated. And so you might even just imagine your attention there at that point as a kind of opening. All of the points on the body have names. And this point is called foot overlooking tears. When I was writing these down, my pen ran out of ink. And when I went to make the line on top, I made it in the wrong place. So it looked like foot overlooking fears. And I thought how appropriate that this is 
a point to help us to release our tears and also our fears. And you might even feel as if it's a river flowing out through that left foot. And from that left foot, bringing your attention up to the right wrist. And the point on this right wrist is a place where you might imagine what I imagine is Wonder Woman and her magical bulletproof cuffs right where that star would be. And just bringing your attention to the right arm, to that place. And this point is called Outer Gate. It's a gatekeeper. Where and in what ways are the gates, have the gates been closed? Where have the gates been open? Is that gate functioning in a healthy way to open when it needs to open, to close when it needs to close? Have we been too closed in? Connecting in with the energetics of that point to function in its optimal way, in an appropriate way. So the gate isn't slammed shut. It'll never open ever again. Nor is it recklessly to open. And looping around from that right wrist, looping your consciousness up over your head, coming to your left wrist to that same point. Bringing your consciousness there. And as if through your consciousness you had the capacity to open that point. Just allow that to happen. Sometimes the most powerful thing we can do is to give a thing our presence. So you're simply giving your attention to these places and points of possibility on your body. And from your left wrist, allow your attention to drop down, crossing over the body to the right foot, to that same point you did on your left to the right. Allowing that river to open up, foot overlooking tears, foot overlooking fears, allowing that to open, release. And then feeling this connectivity, you might imagine an infinity loop from your left foot to your right wrist, to the left wrist, to the right foot, to the left foot, to the right wrist, to the left wrist, to the right foot, to the left wrist, until you've established this connection and opened up this circuit. And knowing that opening up circulation through these points opens up your belt channel, what is called the girdling vessel, literally like a girdle, it holds it all in. And here we are opening it, giving ourselves a chance to release. And as your pelvis opens, the girdle is freed up. See what happens when you allow your jaw to relax even more than it had been. The jaw and the pelvis mirror each other. So when you can allow your jaw to relax, it allows the pelvis to relax. And when you can allow the jaw to relax, it allows the vagus nerve in the body to relax, which cues the entire nervous system to know that it's safe and it can exhale. Having opened these points, 
of possibility in these channels of change on your body, in your body, individually and collectively here. Bring your attention now to the soles of your feet, the very soles of your feet. There is a point in the center of the soles of the feet, which is called gushing spring or bubbling spring. If you were to stand up, it's the point, it's a place that contacts the earth energy. Right? The powerful gushing spring coming forth. The freshness of spring, the growth of spring. And allow the energy of spring, of bubbling spring, of fresh, clear water to come through the soles of your feet and creating a triangle with the very crown of your head. The very crown of your head, there's a point there which we call hundred convergences, infinite convergences, everything converges at the crown of the head, creating a triangle, bubbling spring, at the soles of the feet, filling, nourishing, fresh, clear water, connecting up with the crown of the head as it lifts up. And then releasing any effort here to visualize. Simply allow yourself to rest in your natural presence. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. Just allow. Thank you, Mona. KJ is now standing. She's thinking where to go. She's following her feet. She's unsure if the light is red or green. But she's walking regardless. She's taking Mona's infinite possibilities, wearing them. Living in them. Our next reader is Chris Funkhauser. Um, one second, let me unmute him. Okay. Christopher Funkhauser is a writer, musician, and multimedia artist, and much more. His website and his bio is in the chat. He will again read for a brief moment and then return later on. Christopher? First ladies of the USA, Martha, Abigail, Martha, Dolly, Louisa, Sarah, Anna, Leticia, Priscilla, Elizabeth, Julia, Sarah, Mary, Julia, Lucy, 
Francis, Caroline, Edith, Helen, Edith, Florence, Grace, Lou, Eleanor, Anna, Mamie, Jacqueline, Ladybird, Claudia, Pat, Thelma, Betty, Elizabeth, Rosalind, Eleanor, Nancy, Barbara, Hillary, Laura, Michelle, Melania. That was a poem I wrote after attending the third to last reading I saw before the pandemic, an early February book launch for Sparrows, Abraham, and Woodstock. The title follows popular nomenclature. My title would be better phrased as first women, and the combination of the subjects here reminds me how I wonder when we will get to have a non male president. It's about time. We would be better off. Good readings often inspire poetry for me. I miss going to them as well as rehearsing with the band I play in most serene Congress. Much of my work in the past decade has involved digital audio production. This has continued during C19. Three projects came up right away. In mid-March, realizing I couldn't record readings anymore, I recorded Neighborhood Frogs and used them to instigate a collaborative music project called Asynchronous Fields, which is happening via Google Drive. And I'm going to, I've been inviting people in to collect these sounds and play with them and submit them and have other people play with them. I'll post that link on the chat during the break. Here's a poem I wrote at the last reading I was at. Late February, a launch party for Jenny Offill's Weather in Tivoli, New York. It's an acrostic listening through her presentation with Amitabha Kumar. Kumar. It's an, in a nice coincidence, Jenny's husband playing on this track along with Marcus Salgado and William Staples. Jenny Offill. Just epigraph. Nothing notes your only 15 in print. It looked like just explorers aiming novel. Yeah. Open for funny irony. Lot learned. Just explanation. Not no. You will find, find, and little like just England. Not, not you. Out for friendly, I, Leningrad, library, Japan, Europe, notably novels. You're on form for it, last, novel. Just ever, novel. Not you. Synchronous fields, I'll place that and play it on. Thank you, Chris. We will come back to him. We now go to Alina Alexander. Um, Alina will read for her full amount of time. Um, again, the full bio is in the chat room. Alina's work, Alina Alexander's work has appeared in many journals. She wrote and edited footnotes. Six choreographers inscribed the page. 
Alina has a lot more than that in her in her being, and I've known her for many years. She's a good friend of mine. I'm very happy to have her here, Alina. I just want to say that I have managed to white out my chat, and um, I don't, um, wait, do, am, am I, all right, wait a second, sorry. You see, I don't, I, I'm not good at chatting while I'm listening and watching, that's what I'm <laughs> Okay, so I don't have a regular, a smartphone, so I'm not in the practice of, yeah. Mobile. Alina, you don't chat while you listen? No, isn't that disgusting? What kind of poet? I know. So the point is also that the things I would say about the work I've been hearing that everyone else is saying beautiful things about, I I'll talk to you later. Yes, right. yes, we will have a talk later. Yes. Okay. Marcella, you too, sweetie. Thank you. Yes. Mona, everyone. Okay, so one poem. Also, thank you to those whom I mailed for showing up. It's really kind of you, and I'm thrilled that you're here. Alina, talk close to the... To the... Okay. okay, all right. Is that thank better? You. Yes, thank you. Okay. Is that being heard and not dropped out? Very good, yes. Sarah Thomas swims the channel for Jean Fleming and all the nurses, doctors, EMSs, EMTs, and those who clean the rooms. Am I being heard? Okay. Jump in somewhere, anywhere, and begin to swim with and within. I'm thinking now, right? Now of that woman who swam the English Channel four times back to back to back to back. An act of endurance with a pleasant ending, champagne and chocolates. For whom, I wonder? Perhaps for her team, her crew? And who knew for certain if she would be able to do this? It was supposed to be 80 miles of lift and kick and lift and kick, but ended up becoming 130. Tides, you see. You cannot expect nature to adhere to your plan the way a jellyfish adhered to her face as she swam. A harsh sting, yes, yet without consequence of deterrence, no. Did she ever lose consciousness of where she was? How many strokes yet to come? How many times she had gone first one way, the other? Did she count beats, each arrival the completion of a stanza, know the feeling of life's undertow, like, say, the way the poet Paul Ceylon did? He, too, threw himself into water. Intention is, if not everything, something. Ceylon showed endurance until he couldn't. Ditto the writer V. Wolfe. Yet why think of a poet or writer? Add them to this ardor of muscle, of shoulder, arm, hip, and leg, of breast. The cancer Sarah Thomas had had only two years before her four crossings, swimming after surgery during the radioactive chemotherapeutic days. The mind bends to comprehend contorts into odd positions, bringing this one along with that one, never knowing the next sentence it is about to speak. Must be something in the water, locating hallucinatory shapes on the horizon, right there, there. Two friends in first grade, sisters, met in the dust of Missouri. I hated Missouri. Loved two sisters who'd had polio, and one moved using crutches, the other scooting herself along the floor. And I can remember Patty and Judy's faces perfectly, they enduring their difficulties with humor and patience. And we might wish some moments held more grandeur and pleasure, or simply more light, as Goethe is said to have said as his final words before dying, Merlich. Yet it seems those words were, Mach doch den zweiten Fensterladen auf, damit mehr Licht hier reinkommt. 
And anyone can see that that's not more light, but more, more. And what he's actually said to have said was, open the second shutter so that more light may come in, which I find astonishing enough, as he knew his lights were soon to be doused. Doused. Bringing back Sarah Thomas, showing rigor, not doubt, as one might when writing, language moving lap by lap, pushed this way and that. Tides. And what kept Sarah Thomas busy, as a brute on land is busy, plowing, plowing, not waves but earth, mindless. But that sting, imagine it like a thin whip's lash digging into skin, yet nothing to her, saying what hurt more was salt water really hurts your throat, your mouth and tongue. As can words, though metaphor is no substitute for physical torment or ache, if at times arising from them, and I know what else is hurting throat, mouth, and tongue, words that convey that something is here to humble us, even as we don't do humble very well, or the words dying alone, while one's loved ones feel confused and guilty, though absolution must be total. And it makes me grateful that the death of my own beloved was just him and me, and I was there, right there, and he not shoved onto a rolling morgue, refrigerated truck, yet were there no trucks and no refrigeration, what then? I shudder as if chilled, cough toward my inner elbow, back off from the complaint, then think of my friend John's sister Jessica, whom I don't know personally, but know is a nurse, and about my friend Jean, who has been my friend and a nurse for decades and still is both, and who comes home from work now and carefully removes her clothes, trying to keep her husband and a son who'd been home from college safe, at which point, her clear blue eyes fill with tears traveling down and over her high cheekbones. And I only mention these particular features of only one nurse because she has meaning for me, this woman, Jean, whom I have known for decades. Jean, who used to be a caterer. And you might say she'd be out of work now, though Jean would be filling up food baskets and is not lacking at all for work in her current profession. Current. She is swimming through her days as they all are, too busy to have the luxury of thinking at the moments they are doing, these nurses, doctors, trying to stave off wave upon wave of death. They are there always to save lives, not lose them, and in such large numbers, too. They are not used to this. And here is the poet Stevie Smith, cannonballing in. And I, no nurse, so much time these days to paraphrase, say, they are not waving but drowning. But no, inversely, they keep waving and waving, enduring, enduring. And Paul Salon said, down Melancholy's rapids, past the blank wound mirror, there the 40 stripped life trees are rafted. Single counter swimmer, you count them, touch them all. And Virginia Woolf said, the sea was indistinguishable from the sky, except that the sea was slightly creased, as if a cloth had wrinkles in it. The wave paused and then drew out again, sighing like a sleeper whose breath comes and goes unconsciously. And I end here, somewhere, anywhere, will this once give the final words of this uncertainty to the swimmer Sarah Thomas, who said, it took forever and the current pushed me all over and said, the water wasn't as cold as I thought it might be, but it was still chilly and said this, every length had something that was really hard about it. Thanks. <sighs> Mm. 
Thank you, Lena. Mm. Wow. Beautiful, beautiful work. Um, we will talk later. Um, Marcella? Sorry, I was so captured, carried away. This with the whole experience. Okay. Thank you. What a great event this is. Just the dance with the poetry. So I'm going to read a little bit from a new manuscript called A, a Winter Triangle. Um, so, um, which is kind of about trying to develop a new poetic form. Design for a water clock after Al Jazeera. The hands are leaves as are the lines leading from center to home and small dots of direction are colors, maybe arranged strangely, green shading into purple, not a strict progression of spectrum, but more the undersides of trees at evening, the day changing from luminous to tenebrous diurnal structure that expands and contracts powered by some glimpse of shade. Uneven stream, complicates progression, so water makes a sound somewhat like a car hum, which trails to the hush of a spider building a web. The entire machine floats a museum to silk and scissors, suspended on the fabulousness of experience together held in circular returns to twelves and centers. Automata Technology, the Book of Al Jazeera. Water and candle clocks, fountains change their shapes. Automata pour drinks. Water pours out of peacock's mouths. Automata with semi-automatics. Ten face off against the other ten. Ten move fingers up and down with a stick. Automata smile nicely and pour drinks. Bees carry ropes on their backs. Ropes covered in pollen. Sacks suspiciously yellow. Thieves who stole my flowers. Ten loves every other number, divisible by ten. Ten wonders how to fit in four or three. Ten desires to be a hundred, a thousand, or a million. Ten contains all numbers and reaches out for more. Garden filled with automata. Uncanny valleys under the moon. Move and moving strangely. Water pours from the uncanny moon's mouth. The etiquette of scribes. Understand the proportion of one letter to another and of your emotion in proportion to mine. This selfishness is intolerable. Either side I deserve better missive or an apology the depth of an ocean comprised of centuries of hurricanes of tears, oceanic sobbing and contrition clouds eternally closing over the globe, hunkering down in an earth of mud sinking into its own regret over having treated me so very badly. The Picklock's Frustration. The lock is a masterpiece which the maker submitted when applying for membership to a guild. The keyhole was deliberately concealed and can be used only after releasing a movable panel on the back of the lock by means of a hidden mechanism. Various other movable panels, revolving shields etched with coats of arms, and circular apertures in the lock are meant to confound all efforts of the pick lock, of whom there is only one, and of whom we will never know his or her face. Even now the picklock escapes over the sands and snows of the endless spectral fierce ranges over yon, carrying this very lock in a pocket, not the stoop that we look at through glass, mystified as ever. In order to develop a septentrional, one's numbers must be in order. And to order one's numbers, one must listen to sounds carefully. I hear a high-pitched whine and metallic thunder that almost blends with my own thoughts of how difficult silence is to find, and when found, eardrum noise is just as loud. It is almost as difficult as finding darkness in a city. 
Until then, an approximate double dactyl, a weak form, a shadow of true form, does not have sound, but is not silent. The septemtrienol will be the resolution of form within seven syllables and yet have the feeling of wind blowing through it. It has not quite resolved to its numbers. It has not quite resolved in form quite yet. It needs to be quieter and to find its direction. An external reality persists in noise and distraction. To search through numbers, all of the numerals, when they were first invented, to think, to be away from, to find silence within a form, to find silence along the line, include a space, a caesura as large as one wants it to be, include a space, a caesura, a place for wind to come through, a space within the line inside the form for air to enter. Instead of turning elsewhere in a wall of words to turn otherwise and travel somewhere else to blow away, a space within the line as the lion could be, a place for invention, as here could be where the new is invented. Thank you. Thank you. To dance to poetry with poets reading when you don't know the poems or the readers, maybe one, is to dance from a subliminal place. What Elizabeth said last night, I, I think about that, how my use of language is leading people into dancing from a place that's before language, that's nonverbal, but there is not not language in this place. I can work the fathoms of my understanding without knowing that my movement is directly related to your words, as well as not compose directly but through this vibration of connection of sound, word, sound, body, sound, vibration, that is not even metaphysical or physical or I practice uncertainty, transitions, I trust humans and nature ultimately. Okay, so we'll close with um, um, Chris, Chris von Kauser. All right, I'm going to share my screen here, right, Edwin? Yes, I think, can, are you able to do that? Let's find out. There you go. This set focuses on a couple of other sonic occurrences during Corona Geddon. In late February, just after the National Center for Biotechnology Information released the genome. Chris, closer to the mic. 
In late February, just after the National Center for Biotechnology Information released the genome for coronavirus, the artist known as Shardcore converted it into musical notes. In mid-March, my bandmate Leonard Navarez alerted me to that project, so I checked it out and discovered that Shardcore posted a MIDI file uh, offering others a chance to play with it. I downloaded it, added my own instruments to it using Ableton Live. That's the sound that's playing now, which is much more sinister than both Shardcore's version and another audio iteration of the sequence created by Marcus Bueller at MIT. You can find mine at the Asynchronous Fields folder and links to others posted on the chat. Four days ago, I had my first socially distanced jam session with Navarro's. We set up in his driveway and garage and played for over two hours without being within 10 feet of each other, adding four layers of input to my COVID composition using Ableton Live. I have enjoyed the distancing project. It was great to get back to creating something with someone else in space. I feel as though some of this interval's work has been embodied, such as putting myself on hardware in a position to capture natural sounds, using breath to embody, to create sounds and language, and even listening through and reading through process pieces, which inevitably involves body parts. But this outdoor meeting of musicians was greatly appreciated. Here are a couple of poems to go along with it. The first was composed after being asked to furnish a poetry video to the Albany Poets Group. It's a predictive text, a poem dedicated to George Quasha that my daughter Aleatory shot a video of and is posted on their site. Poetry is, poetry is not a luxury, poetry is, poetry is like, poetry is not a luxury analysis, poetry is as important as poetry is not a luxury citation, poetry is as pointless as poetry is a luxury, poetry is what gets lost in translation, poetry is an island, I think we can make one of those right now, too, if I do this right. Poetry. Poetry is, poetry is not a luxury. Poetry is, poetry is not a luxury analysis. Poetry is like, poetry is as pointless as poetry is, as important as poetry is what gets lost in translation. Poetry isolation. Poetry is an island. Poetry is a luxury. Poetry. There we go. Yeah, okay, so I'll finish now with, uh, let me say, the last piece is another acrostic, a read-through of a 2005 Newsweek article titled, Of Birds and Men. Terrible title, right? Let me get this back here. Can I, uh, here's my mask. There we go. Beneath the dashboard, as my wife says. A Birds and Men, subtitled, A Deadly Virus. This is 2005. A deadly virus is brewing in Asia. Could this be the next killer pandemic? It was shocking to see the article, which I recently came across while organizing my archive. It was saved as part of the documents we collected when we were preparing to move to Asia for a year. Reading the article 15 years later was astounding, it, as it's clear that World Health Organization, Dr. Fauci, whose research is cited, and others knew that something like C-19 was going to happen. It is more than dumbfounding that nations around the globe are not better prepared for it, given what appears in this lengthy article. Could out reduce officials new around viruses into recent useful spread. Clearly on rooms other, nations at vaccine increase, research universities say, can option right 
ordered not antibodies, versatility, infecting reduction, Utah spike. Cases, one reservoir, outbreaks, nature, and various in response, upstates. Chicken on reverse organisms, neuraminidase allows virologists into remove, used, starting companies of react. Other nasal, actual vaccinate, inadequate, rapidly unveiled, said, convening officials, reduce order, numbers already, vaccine if recommendation, up services. All right, other sound engagements I've been involved with include contributing to Keith and Mendy Obadake's collective unity gain project, which is also open to everybody as well as producing radio program, Poet Radio on WGXC. I recorded last month's edition of my show <laughs> via my phone using yeah. FaceTime. And uh, last week, Most Serene Congress released its third album titled Defense Wanted. Thank you very much. It was fun. Thank you, Chris. Um, I better turn that off, sorry. Um, I would say that this is the official um, ending of the reading and now the beginning of the talking. Thank you all, that was so beautiful. There, there's so many cross parallels with, um, with depth and space and isolation possibility and through it all KJ Holmes has been dancing and moving KJ that's been so beautiful to watch you um, do you want to say a few words yeah. um, that was so um, necessary to transform my space uh, and to have that amount of time to uh, absorb the words, but also to release some of my own through my movement. Um, uh, I, I had a, a, originally had a score of working with, uh, I've been creating this, what I'm calling the formula for wings, and it, it has to do with some an anatomical and metaphorical parts of the body, the lower body, the middle body, and then the, the skull. And then I found when I started, I didn't need to have the score that it would present itself through the relationship with the readers and um, my space. Um, There's also a certain trust that you have to build up within yourself to allow the score to unfold without having a preconceived structural score, right? I think so. I mean, I, I'm a kind of improviser that will destroy the score to come back to it or you know like somehow let it dissolve in some way but there's there's uh i, I really think that uh, when you're when i'm moving when when we improvise uh we're creating history in the space so it, i step back into it just incidentally because I, I remain in the space um so that is yeah, I think there's something there. Um, that's a really interesting parallel to Mona. Mona, like, about creating history in space, or, or rather, maybe adding history to your own space. Um, you, you work with, uh, in, in your practice, you're working with your clients in this format. I've spoken to other healing practitioners about this idea, how you're sort of reconfiguring their space with your space and how that's history in the making, literally. How do you, um, how do you work with your... your um, um, with this loss of touch, in a way. Good question. Um, a little closer to the microphone. Oh, sorry. It's actually been rather remarkable, I have to say. I mean, of course, I feel a little, uh, you know, I have job insecurity, basically. But because in my office, as an acupuncturist, I would primarily primarily rely on those shiny metal objects that are medical equipment called needles. That's, that's the medical treatment. Um, and the rest of it is like what I also do, and that, but not the 
center stage. And so now with the folks who I am working with in this sort of virtual format, I really am connecting with the energetic aspect of stimulating the points and how obviously this, what I shared today was just like a little touch in, you know, like a little dip into what it could be to guide someone into a process of going inside their own body. And for me, as I do that, I have to go there inside myself too, in a way much more so, I would say, even than when I'm in the office using needles, much more so. So I've actually been amazed by the intimacy and the the potency, the effectiveness, basically, of being able to work with folks through doing this kind of um, visualization through the channels, energetic stimulation of the points, and really creating a kind of circuit, even in this Zoom world we're living in. Um, Earlier today, I worked with a couple and I was guiding the partner um, the partner to place her hands on her partner's body at particular points. And then I talked both of them through a process so that she could receive a treatment from her partner, which was actually also very apropos as they're going through an insemination process. And I thought, who better to give the the treatment actually than her partner rather than even a professional, you know, but it was amazing. I kind of felt I was in the room with them. So anyway, I, uh, sorry, I'm going on, but, but uh, it's, great. Uh, it's, cool. it's we need touch. I mean, I think we need touch, but I really have been genuinely surprised myself as to what can happen from a, um, a at a distance. And it and I would say it. You can't check out. I can't check out. They can't check out because now we're like, okay, we're we are really ha- having to kind of sync up here. And so, yeah. Thank you. Mm-hmm. Um, Marcella, um, so. The, the, your work has always been so much about um, this sort of ecological um, mining underneath language, almost. And I wonder if there's something you can uh, talk about um, referencing this, uh, this sense of touch or lack thereof. How, if, if you're, um, uh, how you're allowing your, your sensation um, in this time to affect your work. That makes sense. <laughs> well, we're doing. Um, I've been teaching a class on ecology and poetry, and we've been doing a lot of work um, on thinking about where we're supposed to be as humans. And one student actually said, "You know, maybe this is where we're supposed to be inside our our homes, in place." Um, and it, so we've been talking about that a lot, and I've been doing kind of non-ambulatory walk exercises with Rachel Levitsky too, where you don't actually have to be mobile, which is interesting. Um, but walking... Is, uh, the, is there a supposed to be that we're supposed to be in? No, I mean, that's the problem, is that as a species, we don't know what our niche is. So that's part of the problem, is where's our niche. Um, but as a poet, we're also really working on trying to develop um, language to apprehend and express um, some of the issues. And the language is changing so quickly around um, climate change and ecology that I think poets are, we have a real place in working deeply in language in a creative way to um, deal with that. So like we don't even have the language, like we're talking about how prepositions are so um, lacking in terms of expressing interrelationships, like prepositions are so binary, like you're either under or above, you're with or without, you're in or you're out. So how do you get a preposition that really describes the something existing in two places at the same time or interrelatedness So we're talking a lot about developing new kinds of prepositions? Mm-hmm. Cool. Mm-hmm. Excellent. So, Alina, um, if you could uh, chime in a little bit here, where um, you're, you're talking about, you're, you're taking all these ideas uh, that we're talking about and relating them to a personal story, um, either the swimmer or, or your own life. Where, 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 where's your place in poetry? <laughs> Oh man, that's so funny that you say that. A little closer to the microphone. Okay, sorry. It's funny that you say that. I ended up, uh, if you will, accidentally or on the spot, 
uh, reading this poem to Hetty Jones, who can't come in on her computer. And when I finished, she said, oh God, she said, I always write so personally, she said, and how do you do that where you don't and you encounter the world? <laughs> so I can't tell you anything, Edwin. You know, I honestly, I'm j I, I honestly don't have anything to say about my own work. I am, uh, as I said to Sharon Mesmer in an email, I have an antediluvian brain. Uh. <laughs> Um, we'll, we'll pick up on that a little bit later. Chris, um, um, we got the finger on the pulse. Finger on the pulse, that's right, like uh, on the pulse of ourselves. And uh, so, Chris, you were talking about how you, you recently were able to jam with your bandmates, but not together. So, this goes in line with, all, with our, you know, wh where is our distance and where is our sound and our work and our, our connective tissues in, in our work. How does that connect to the people that we can't even be close to? Well, you know, I, I miss my band a lot the last six weeks or eight weeks, and uh, I thought it would be a great way for we are when we're all very serious about the, the distancing. Like we are, we know each other through our kids. We're like we're staying home. Sorry, when the curve flattens, I'll see you guys again. So we set, I set up that uh, the online project where we could do file exchanges and. Um, that was okay, and, and some Brazilian friends of mine got involved with it, and other people uh, that I knew, very small scale. Now I wanted to open up and you know make the, some of these recordings you know available to others. But then last weekend we did get to, two of us got together and we played. There was a situation with one of my bandmates where he was furloughed from his job, and he just had to he kind of had to do something. And his I think his wife also realized he had to do something. So we were like. We're going to play in the driveway. And it was, and it was, and it was great because, you know, we got an extension cord. I brought all my gear over, a beautiful digital recording. <laughs> and we didn't have to be near each other. And we had masks on. I didn't, I touched a table and I touched an extension cord. He wiped it down. There was no, I mean, we had to, you know, and, and, if, and we're going to do it again two weeks after we've proven that, that we didn't infect each other. You know? So it's getting to be that time, I think, where, like, if you're smart, you know, uh, or desperate, it's time to, you know, try to make things, a little things happen again. I don't, you know, I, I, I want safety for all. I don't want to jump the gun at all. I, I expect to be kind of troglodytic for the next few months, except on these occasions where we can uh, commune, right? We talked before, uh, before the show started, we had a brief conversation with, about the pressure that's building and how reactive we become Un unexpectedly out of necessity because the volume and, and the distance um, to to let air to let it out to to just like breathe in to to just be ha is changing so that uh, affects the teapot inside us to kind of just blow up and and how now there's so much desire to kind of get get back whatever the get back means. Um, uh, Mona, I wonder if you might talk up a little about about getting back and what what that might mean to <laughs> get back from where you know. I you know it's a sign. I pressed stay muted, stay <laughs> stay muted by accident <laughs> to that question. No, yeah, I mean. We can all relate to stay muted. I'm sorry. Yeah, right. I'm like. We can all relate. <laughs> um, it's interesting because I. You know, one is there's an, I don't think there's any getting, well, of course, there's nothing getting back to what it was, you know, what it was like that ship has sailed, that's over, I right. think, yeah. for, you know, any foreseeable. But, um, you know, there was like a town hall meeting last night and of the in the acupuncture community, which I missed. But a friend was telling me about it. And it's, mm, I mean, basically, the guidelines are like, you'll be wearing PPE, there's nothing, there's no sheets, there's no carpets, there's no pillowcases, there's no one in the waiting room, there's no, it's just really, you're using Viricide. Like, to me, it doesn't sound like I'm going to be any in any kind of rush. And in New York City, I feel, I don't know if this is what you're asking, but I feel like people will have to largely take public transportation. So unlike some other, you know, 
places where someone could drive in their car, they could wait in the car, then there's one person at a time here. I just don't feel like I want to participate in people coming on the subway and all of this, at least not now. So in some way, I feel like I'm really just day to day. I am not thinking like, oh, I'm going to be back. I don't quite know. Maybe I'm in denial, but I just feel like uh, that, you know, someone else at this point probably needs the PPE, although, our, you know, they're selling it in our acupuncture supply places. So, yeah, so I don't, I really don't know. I mean, that's the truth of it is I don't know it, but I'm not like counting the seconds to just try to get back as soon as possible because I think I feel more, I feel cautious. And it's so, of course, it's so intimate. And yeah. and how are you, one, how is one really going to be sure and the aerosolization? So, so I don't, I don't know, you know, I'm, I'm taking it day to day really. Yeah, but m much more on the cautious side. Yeah, yeah. The same, the same is true of us on the other end too, though, because I, I rely on a chiropractor and, in, and it's, I haven't, you know, been able to go see him. He told me he wasn't using mask and gloves. I was like, sorry, guy, you know, uh, I mean, that was, a, that was last month. So I need to get in touch with him again. But so it works for everyone. It's like, it's the disabled and the, and the able. Absolutely. Absolutely. And it's yeah. interesting during, during the, uh, um, the, the basic reality of, uh, of getting back or, or what normal might be. Um, language is continuing and language is forming and language is trying to exist in some way. And as, as, as Marcella mentioned about this, this idea of like, you know, what, what, where, where's language's place? Where's the place for language to exist? And um, there's no definitive answer. I think it's interesting to see how, how poets or, or, or language makers have always existed in this sort of parallel reality. Or, or maybe it is, it's the real reality. It's just kind of this uh, other uh, sense of perception that allows us to um, um, either um, not get bogged down or get totally bogged down, or, 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 or I, I should say not bogged down. The sensorial aspect of, of the world around us is heightened where we let the language affect us and then we, we, we sort of invert it and have it come back out as, as new language in a way. So um, I, I, I'm not sure where I was going with that, but the, the idea of, of, uh, of our trying to exist where we are right now and how that affects us as language makers that need to be talking about this existence or, or this lack thereof is an interesting parallel. The, the, the paradox of that understanding and not knowing is heightened. I, I, I could talk a little, just a moment, um, about being a dancer in these times and also a writer, but uh, I, I, one of the things about transforming my space tonight was that I've been teaching remote. I teach um, uh, an actor's movement and I had um, at NYU. Um, and uh, my classes are usually very physical. We, we engage really with the body. I mean, like not just in space, but with moving each other around and, and um, it's not new, but I think that the, the way that I have to use language to have people touch, get touched in a certain way through, through metaphor, through uh, the poetics of the body, I think that's really, really important right now. Yeah. Yeah. Especially like when I'm looking at these freshmen, not just only, but who are now in their bedrooms where they grew up and not in a studio together with each other feeling very isolated from their, their, their classmates and how do they feel, how do they connect? And I think it really is through language often. Mm. Perceptual play, but the language that leads them into understanding the, a, a vibration that they can still feel. And um, I, I really believe in the poetics of the body. The somatics is uh, the imagination. The soma is the imagination as much as the body. Mm. Mm. So, um, yeah, I think, and you know, I really appreciated Mona. Your, I mean, everybody's words were just so moving. But th something about like, oh, lead me into my body with that expertise. Mm -hmm. You know, like what you're saying that I can't go to the chiropractor. I can't, you know. So, and then how everyone's words led me to the elements of our world. You know, the reality of it, and then also the nature of it. And 
So thank you. So, so on that note, we're going to sort of end, but we're going to linger a little bit. This is like a little. Um, we all deserve this. Air horn. And we deserve this. And uh, we can deserve a little bit of a, um, a little bit of salsa, to sabe? Um. Thank you all for coming. We're gonna linger a little bit, but uh, um, we were we were blessed by Marcelo Duran, Chris Funkhauser, Mona Chopra. Eileen Alexander and KJ Holmes. Come back next week, next uh, Wednesday, round three, I mean week three. And uh, thank you so much for coming. Edwin, thank you for bringing us together. It's fantastic. Thank you, Edwin. Thank you. That was fantastic. Thank you, that felt good, right? I felt the Reiki. You felt the Reiki. <laughs> yeah, and that, Mona, your meditation was really good too. That uh, I was already feeling that infinity before you already, before you said it. Like I could, was already visualized and flowing. It was very nice.